So I'm hoping.
Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and the Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. And I'm Scott. And I'm Sam. For math homework help, call in Bakersfield, 636-4357. Everywhere else, 1-866-636-6284. Our email is dothemath at kern.org. We're online at dothemathonline.net. And on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, nicely done. So, Sam, where do you go to school and what grade are you in? Uh, I go to Stockdale Elementary and I'm in sixth grade. Do you have all of that social media stuff? No. I don't either. <laughs> Do the math has it all, but today's a big day for you. Oh, yeah. We're going to get this right out of the way right now because, because you volunteered to tell us what is the so big deal about today. Uh, today is my birthday. And today is your birthday. So I don't know if they have a little happy birthday song back there or not, but how about, Scott, you and I real quick? A one and a two and a three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, dear Sam. Happy birthday to you. There you go. See, I forgot to go right that. It's good thing they didn't like this. Oh, you know, we did port too badly on that. Anyway, so how is sixth grade going? It's pretty good. It's pretty good. What is the, what's the worst thing about sixth grade so far? Because you've been in school for about a month or so. What's the worst thing about it? You're like, I wish they would do this or something different. Well, we have like a weekly purple packet that I am not in love with. <laughs> okay, the purple packet. You don't like the purple packet. What's in the purple packet? It's like reading, uh, like <laughs> comprehension questions. Okay, so you're figuring once you got it, you got it. Uh -huh. You just don't like keeping uh -huh. on doing it repetitively no. and stuff like that. It's new every week. <clears throat> well, that's good that it's new every week. Oh, well, yeah. Okay, so you put up with it, you deal with it. Yeah. You tolerate it. Uh huh. You're happy with it. Barely. Everything's all cool though, because today's your birthday. All right, you ready to do a uh, social media problem with me right now? Sure. Well, let's take a look at the monitor right up here. So this is one of the problems. They get posted on social media every day, and this is the problem of the day. 10 plus 8 times, and in parentheses, 12 minus 9. So, Sam, when you look at that, what is the first thing you think we need to do? Parentheses. Why? Because of uh, germ dos. Right, because of germ dos. You know what? I'm very glad that you said that instead of <laughs> pem dos, right? Because germ dos is the new way where you group instead of just do parentheses. So, we're going to do the parentheses first. So, what does that give us? Three. Three. So, now we have 10 plus 8 times 3. What comes next? 8 times 3. 8 times 3. Why that one first? Because usually you read from left to right. Don't we do math in order from left to right? Well, yeah. No. No, no, no. <laughs> well, why not? <laughs> because of the germ dos. Oh, because of the germ dos. So, once we do grouping, we don't have any exponents or radicals. So, we multiply, divide. Mm -hmm. That's where we're at. All right. So, 8 times 3 again? 24. So then what's next? 10 plus 24. Is? 34. So which one do you think it is? I think it's A. You think it's A? I know it's A. You know it's A. You confident in A? I'm very you, confident in A. You willing to bet on it? I'm willing to bet all my money That's on That's what it. I want to hear. That's a confidence right there, all right? You're betting on 34. Let's see if she's correct. Ah, there you go. First one done. Ah, birthday luck right there with that problem. All right. Hey, don't forget that we do have uh, phone tutors available most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year between 3.30 and 5.30. Lots of different ways to get a hold of us. Sam told you about a lot of them. And uh, don't forget, do the math online.net. That way, if you ever miss an episode and you remember, hey, I saw one of my friends on there, or I know they were talking about a math problem that I'm working on, you can always go back and check it out at do the math online.net. Time now for today's Math in the News. All right, today's Math in the News. Once again, we are fortunate enough to have somebody in studio, and with us today is Laura James. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm excellent. Thank you for being here. You are from the Los Angeles County Office of Education. Yes. And I'm, I, I've got notes here, but I'm going to try to do this once again without looking at the notes. The California County 
Education Technology Consortium. Correct. Or was I at least close enough? You, were, you were dead on. That was spot on? Exactly. There you go. So <laughs> what is this consortium that you're a part of? Um, we are a statewide consortium of county offices across California, and our focus is to provide digital resources to schools, um, as um, with especially visual resources, media. Um, okay. Many of our students are visual learners, and so this is a way of being able to provide the content to them in a way that speaks to them. And this has been around since the 1980s. Correct. So, of 1982, so over 40 years. And is every county involved in this, or is it just? It is, certain counties. It's just certain counties. So different counties will opt in depending on what services they provide to the districts that they serve. And so we have currently about 13 county offices across the state going all the way down from San Diego County. And then we have a, all the way up to Northern California, Humboldt and Glen County. Okay. And how did you get involved in this? Was it because the office you work at, you are in this kind of a position and they said, hey, we want you to be part of this. and. So um, our county joined the consortium prior to my coming into the county office. And so um, we always had um, digital, digital media that we shipped to schools. And um, as we had some budget cuts that we had to deal with, we lost our content evaluators. And so as a way of shoring that up in our office, we joined the consortium as a collaborative because um, the work of the consortium, the different county offices were able to bring in resources, so people resources that we no longer could afford because of budget cuts. And okay. so the collaboration of the group is something that was inviting and, and welcoming to us and to be able to, to also then continue to provide services to our schools. So KETN is obviously part of Kern County Superintendent of Schools Office, mm -hmm. and you guys that are part of this consortium are able to use programming from KETN. Is that correct? Um, or K -E -T -N. in a roundabout kind of? Sort of, kind of. So, okay. so the, the consortium will license the content that gets shared to all the counties okay. in the state. And so KETN, being a member of the consortium, has access to the content gotcha. that is licensed by the consortium. And a lot of instructors probably know California streaming because I know I used it in my classroom and we've got some up here right now. This is the homepage for California streaming. And this is free to all educators. No, it is it is a, a membership service. Okay, well, I've been, I, I just take it for granted because I've always been using it. <laughs> right, so it is a membership service, but the membership, mon the funds that we gather from the membership goes directly back into the product. We are not for profit as county offices okay. of education, so it, developing the product as well as licensing content so that we can provide those resources. To so students. you're able to get on California streaming and I'm doing something in class and I want to look something up to help enrich my class. Correct. And one of the things that we do actually in class is a stock market game. Correct. So we're going to look at... So like, let's, say, let's say you were trying to find some resources to help students invest money. So do an investing money search. So we'll go um, investing money. Mm -hmm. okay. And so then what will happen is it'll search for titles that have either that in the title or have it in the keywords or even inside the description. In addition to the search results on the left side, you have filters. So let's say you're looking for a specific um, grade level. So maybe it's for the intermediate grade level. So you could then also even okay, choose right the here. grade levels. Exactly. And then narrow your filters down. And you can even go to the content standards and make exactly. sure that whatever standard you're trying to get across, right. you're meeting it with whatever exactly. you're using off exactly. of here. And so if you look like, say, say that third title that's up there that's um, Money Matters, that would be probably a really good one that you could probably use for um, helping your students understand, the, understand investment of money um, from the beginning. And so this particular title also has segments, which is a really nice way because, you know, sometimes the video, so if you click on, go ahead and click on the segments and you'll see oh, there's okay. different topics there, different so instead Different. of watching all 18 minutes at once, you can just watch parts of it. Exactly. Based on what you're doing that day. Exactly. So let's say you were talking about stock market. So right. there's a steg segment there on stocks, stocks and, and bonds, bonds that you could go ahead and click on that particular title, that, that particular segment, and it'll just bring up that one piece, and then you would be able to watch that with your students um, to give them a back, some background information on the stock market before you jump into teaching them. There we go. And then they can just watch that video right there. and. Right. Uh, Right, and then if you were to scroll down to the bottom of that page below all the segments, you know, if you're an instructor and you're using Google Classroom, you can share it direct to your Google Classroom, or the embed media, say you're using Canvas or Schoology, you can take that code and put it right oh, into perfect. your online class. Because I know class. that, I, I know, I, I can't even imagine some classrooms not using Google Classroom, how easy it is, right. and I know we do, 
and I can just, it, that's as easy as it exactly. is using this website. Exactly, and then that way the kids don't have to log in. It's part of the assignment that you've already given them. They can go back in and watch it as many times as they need to and right into that. Beautiful. So what else do we need to know about this consortium of yours? Um, what our consortium is a really great um, group, a collaborative group where we have a number of people who have strengths that maybe others don't have. And so we work really well together. Like, to be honest, it was scaring me to come up here to talk about oh, math. Oh, come on, because now I'm not all that scary is, up here, right? Ma no, make you do any it's math not problems. you, but it's math. <laughs> math is not my strength. I'm a history English teacher. But so. you're not afraid of math. Um, because we don't want anybody to be afraid of math. <laughs> anybody can do math, right? True. Some people think that they've got to be fast in order to be good at math, Correct. and that is false. Correct. You uh, just need to think deeply about it, take your time with it, <laughs> right? Sometimes. I'm actually not bad at math, but, okay. but it's not my strength. However, we have other folks in the consortium who are stronger in math or say science is really my scary subject. But we're able to build off of one another. And so even when we're going to look at content, a big part of what we do is license content that fits the standards. I'm not going to evaluate science content, but we have other people who okay. can do that. So you have an expertise so, right, in one area. And which, that's what which really helps us in that we have all these strengths and we're able to really go out there and find content that will meet the needs of our teachers because we have folks that know that and have that have that expertise. I know you're busy and I want to thank you for taking some time to visit us today. Uh, before I let you go, are there other states that do similar things to what you're doing in California? Not that I know of. We are very... Right, because I think, you, the, I was looking at the largest one in the country Correct. to provide these type of services. So right. I was wondering if anybody else even did it. Not that I'm aware of. We are, we are special here in California and we're very fortunate that we have such a great group to work together with and provide these resources to our teachers and students. All right, well, you know what, Laura, thank you very much for taking out some time. Thank you. And I know you brought some uh, folks from other counties. So what other counties are represented here today? Today we have San Diego County, um, Madera County. I have another colleague here from LA and of course, Kern. And then I, where's the Tuolumne? Somebody? Tuolumne County, he's, he's out wandering about because I know he's been working with you guys to get his broadcasting up in his county. Um, but we did have earlier today, we met and had some folks virtually on as well. So pretty much all of our county representation was. Okay. Was well, there. you know what, maybe he'll make his way out to the parking garage because I know we've got some stuff going on up there. As a matter of fact, we've got the Bakersfield Museum of Art visiting us today. And we're gonna go and uh, check out with those guys right now. I'm Sam and here we have Abby at the Bakersfield Museum of Art and today um, she's got some group of kids that are going to be um, talking to you about Via Arte. So what are we going on today? So today in honor of Via Arte, um, coming up this October 21st and 22nd, it's going to be the 25th um, year of the Bakersfield Museum of Art putting on Via Arte which takes place at the Marketplace on Ming Avenue in October and there's usually over a hundred artists out there doing chalk art on the ground um, recreating masterworks and there's also areas for kids to come out in $25 gets you a two by two foot square to make your own art and so today in honor of that we're gonna be explaining some of the math on how we take a small image like this and blow it up big to this five foot by five foot piece that we'll be finishing together today All right, kids, are you excited? Yeah. Do you guys like to use chalk pastels? Yeah. Have you ever done Via Arte before? A uh, couple of you? I have. Been there. Been there? You've done it before? Yeah? Never done it? All right, well, you guys are going to have a great time today. And thanks, Abby. And uh, back to you, Mike. Go. We'll check back in with these guys in a little bit right there. Do remember we have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon and that caught me off guard. I was trying to readjust my earpiece and stuff and being able to hear everything right there. And uh, do you want to do a problem? Sure. Yeah, I think you ought to do a problem. So we're going to get to the phone problem in just a minute, but we're going to have you work on a problem really quickly. What I would like you to do, and we're going to, this is going to be a multi-step problem, so remember, we're not going to do the whole thing right now. Okay. What I would like you to do, Scott, is draw a grid 
and it's going to be numbered one through six along the top and one through six along the side. So, uh, kind of like this? Yeah, but you're going to want to make it bigger. Okay. So, probably more of the whole screen. Okay. Uh, make sure you can leave one through six at the top and one through six at the bottom. So, gotcha. number it off and separate it, okay. going one to six down. Okay. And then one through six going across. And then maybe just draw some lines in there to separate all of those different columns and rows. Okay. Years and years of graphing without graph paper, right? All comes in handy at some point. <laughs> what do you think, Sam? So far, so good? I got a little wave in there. I have some art in me as well. Since oh, yeah. today is an art day, then we have a little. Can't make them perfectly straight. That'd be no fun. All right. So, Sam, what I'd like you to do is I want you to imagine these as being dice. You're going to roll dice and you want to see what the outcomes are. So, I'd like you to fill in all of that with what the outcomes would be. So, if you roll a one and a one, what would you get? A two. Okay. So, grab your marker, go ahead and put a two up there where the one and one intersect. And go ahead and put all of the numbers in. Okay. And if you. Uh, Want to discuss anything? You got Scott right there to chat with. Because this is going to be pretty simple to go through those. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward, right? Maybe you're seeing this. Oh, you're going backwards now because I think yeah. you're already seeing the pattern, right? Yeah. Oh, even different pattern. So tell me where you saw that one coming. <laughs> That's pretty good. Oh, uh, well, the sevens go that way. And yeah. If you do. So, so the you're looking at maybe combinations of numbers now, right? Not just yeah. patterns going left to right, but combinations of numbers yes. that equal the same. Three, that can be four. Nice. Five, five, five. So here's my question before you fill in the rest. Yes. Do you think that we'll have the exact same pattern over here? Will it flop over or will it be different? Um, I think it'll be the same. Be a similar pattern, right? Uh -huh. But with just some different numbers, obviously, well, because yes. they're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So when you look at this pattern here, notice we only have two one time, then we have three twice, and we have four three times. Maybe we'll have a similar pattern on this side, right? We'd like to see those patterns, especially in math, and that prepares you for algebra, too. All right, go ahead. There's the eight column, or eight row, or eight diagonal, or whatever you want to <laughs> yeah, say. I was going to say, you're going to have to be diagonal. Yeah, I guess so. Huh? I don't think we have anything there. No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> and that's nine. Yep. And this one should be ten. You got it. So even without looking at the numbers, you're seeing the pattern. And we really like to do that in math, to see patterns even before you know what's happening. Because at some point, someone's going to say, well, if you roll 17 dice, what do you get? Whatever. And you're like, well, based on the pattern, I can figure out what's going on without having to draw out an entire chart. Not that there's anything wrong with drawing an entire chart, <laughs> right? Nice job. So we're going to leave that there. And Sam, why do you think a lot of people, when they roll dice, go, oh, I'm going to use my lucky number seven? Why do you think they always go seven is their lucky number? Because they've had it multiple times. Mm -hmm. Why? How can you show on that that seven isn't just lucky? Well, because it's the most, uh, it's the most possible. Yeah, that's right. It has the most possible, out of all the possibilities, right? Seven yes. comes up the most. Yes. And so it really is more likely that seven is going to come up than any other one. So, I mean, if I'm going to pick a lucky number, I'm going to pick one that's going to come up more often, right? I'm going to say it's my lucky number because I'm more lucky. Yes. <laughs> All right. So we're going to have some more to do with that in just a moment, but right. we're going to leave that one up there right now. We do have phone tutors available until 530. Right now we're going to go to the phones and Abigail, how are you today? I'm good. Good. Nice to hear from you. So Scott, you may want to add a screen. There we go. All right. So Abigail, you are a fifth grade student at Wingland, correct? Yes. All right. As soon as you're ready, let's hear the math problem that you're working on. Okay. Write an equation and a number that each power of 10 re represents. Gotcha. Okay. So do you have some examples already of what's going on in that problem? Um, 10 squared. 10 squared. Yeah, that's a power of 10, right? We have 10 to the second power. What else? Um, 10 with an exponent of 3. Yep, 10 with an exponent yeah. of 3, that's a good one. Sure. And, and we, then so, it goes down to 6. Okay. So your base is always going to be the same, right? 10 to the, this would be the 4th, and we have to the 5th, and 10 to the 6th. And the question is we okay. want to come up with some kind of equation, is that right? Yeah. Gotcha. So it kind of goes back to the problem we were just doing a little while ago. 
we need to have a pattern. We need to have find, establish some kind of pattern about what's going on. Let's see if we can evaluate a couple of these expressions and see if we can see a pattern of what's going on. Do you know what 10 to the second power is, or what does it represent? Um, 100. It does. Why does it represent 100? Because it's 10 times 10. There we go. So that's what's happening. We're actually writing 10 down twice. 10 times oh. 10, two of them and we end up with 100. What about 10 to the third power? What is that answer? Or what is that, if you evaluate it, what do you get? Um, a thousand. It is a thousand, yeah. And you, can you tell me about the tens that we have in that problem? How many tens do you have? Three. 10 times 10 times 10, exactly right. And that goes along with the exponent as well. Let's do one more and we'll see if we can find any more patterns. And maybe if, once we find a pattern, we can figure out kind of what's going on. What's 10 to the fourth power? Um, 10,000? 10, 10,000, you got it, well done. And following our pattern, that means that there are four tens. Yeah. So following the pattern, of course, we could fill out the rest of 10 to the fifth and 10 to the sixth, and even if I t asked you, you could probably do 10 to the 17th without even having to work it out because you could just follow the pattern, right? So the question is, at least in my mind, and maybe hopefully this will kind of go with what whatever, you're talking about here, 10, what if we had 10, this is strange, 10 to the x power, right? We don't know what that, what that exponent is. We're gonna call it x instead. We don't know what number's up there, okay? So let's look back at our pattern. When you, when you evaluate this, 10 to the second power, how many zeros do you have? Uh, two. Two, right. And when you evaluate 10 to the fourth power, how many zeros do you have in that problem? Four? Four, that's it, because it's 10 to the fourth. So if you had 10 to the x, right, we would write a one, and how many zeros? Uh, one? We would write a one for sure, no doubt about that. But the exponent tells you how many zeros it would be. And it's a strange concept to kind of think about, but since you don't know what this number is, we put a letter in there, and it tells you how many zeros there are. We just have to figure out a way to write that. So we're going to have <laughs> x zeros, right? That's what's going to happen there. If x was 5, we'd have 5 zeros. If x was 27, we'd have 27 zeros. So we want to be able to figure out what that means. It also goes along with the power of 10, right? We have a power of 10, and that means that that's how many 10s you're going to multiply together. So if you have 10 to the x power, if you have 10 to the x power, how many 10s? Does that mean that you're gonna have? It's a strange thing to ask, I know. One? It, it definitely gonna put a one there. But we're gonna have, <laughs> are you ready for this? We're gonna have X tens. Kind of a strange thing. However many you want. However many you want. You put any number you want in there. You put any number you want in there and you're gonna have that many tens. So you're gonna multiply all those together. So I'm pretty sure that the question is asking you to be able to figure out a pattern, to be able to figure out what's going on in this problem. And the relationship that I think you're looking for is the exponent tells you not only, not only how many tens are being multiplied, but also how many zeros are in the answer. So hopefully that helps you out, Abigail. And for calling in this afternoon, you've got yourself a pass to the Kern County Fair. So congratulations on that. That opens up tomorrow. So hopefully you have an opportunity to go out and check out uh, some of the fun things to do with the Kern County Fair. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon. And we're going to do a little talking math about mean, median, and mode with Tess. Hi, my name is Tessa and I'll be showing how to do mean, median, and mode. So the numbers I'll be using to demonstrate are three, five, six, and seven. So what I'm going to do first is add all four of those numbers together, which equals 21. Then I divide that by the number of how many numbers there are, which is four. And then I'll get 5.25, and that will equal the mean. Now I'm going to do the median, which is uh, the number in the middle, but this isn't an, an odd number in this set, so 
what you do, you add the two numbers together, which is 11, and then you divide that by 2, which is 5.5, um, and that would be the median. And for the mode, that would be the number that occurs most often. And as you can see, that there's no, there's no numbers that occur most often in this problem. So you're going to put as your answer, none. Four, seven, ten, ten, and eleven. So for this one, the mean, so I'll add all of those together, and that'll equal forty-two, and I'll divide 42 by 5. That'll equal 8.4. And for the median on this one, there are five numbers, and the middle number is 10. So that'll be the median. And then the mode, there are two tens in this problem, so that so 10 will also be the mode. And thank you for listening to how to do um, mean, median, and mode. And big thank you right there to Tess and a little bit of Let's Talk Math right there where we have younger math students coming in and sharing their expertise on any math concept that they would like to share with us. So that was one of our uh, many that we recorded over the summer and uh, I think they're just uh, fabulous to yeah. have well, the kids come in job. and share their expertise with us. We have Sam, a sixth grade student from Stockdale Elementary celebrating her birthday today. How old are you? 14, 15 years old? Uh, 12. 12. All right. I'm only kidding. So you're 12 years old. And uh, you're on live TV today when you're 12 years old? Doesn't get much better than that. That's pretty Special. good. So I see you've got the uh, beret on today. So tell me a little bit about the beret. Is that just a fashion statement? Do you wear berets a lot? Because you're on TV and it's your birthday? And <laughs> no, I wear, I wear berets to my school site oh, right. when I go to your classroom. Okay. <laughs> because you did nickname me Frenchie. That's right, because I saw you wearing berets around school, and you weren't in my class, but I was like, hey, hey, Frenchie, you know, so anyway. All right, so let's go back to your previous screen, okay. and we're going to take a look at the different outcomes. So how many times does the number two come up? Once. Okay, you have to remember that, okay? And if you want to write it down, maybe on the side, maybe two comes up once. How many times does three come up? Two. So I want you to go all the way through, because you're going to get the numbers all the way down to 12. All right. So start figuring out how many times each of them comes up. And let Scott know, and he'll write them in there, because you're going to need to know this in order for the next part of the problem. Uh, four is three. Four is three. Five is four. That's a funny thing to say, huh? Four is three and five is four. Huh? All right, go ahead. Six is five. Six is five. And seven is six. Seven is six. What the heck? So that <laughs> means must, eight must be seven. Yes, that's true. Is that true? No. Oh. Eight is five. So this is a wonderful pattern to see, and at the same time you have to realize the extent of the pattern, and the pattern changes, right? Yes. I mean, it's still similar, but it changes. All right, eight is what? Five. Uh oh. Nine, Nine is, is four. four. Ten is three. Ten is three. And then if we had to squish these ones in here, 11 and 12. Right. 11 is 2, two. and 12 is 1. 1, gotcha. So okay, we so go from 1 to 6, and then back to 1. Right, so you need to know those outcomes, how many times each of those outcomes comes up. So go, let's go to your new board. Okay. So you now are going to have a set of dice. One of the die can have no numbers larger than 4. Oh. So you know it's a six-sided die, so some numbers are going to come up more than once. No number can be higher than 4. <laughs> the other die, the six die, can have whatever numbers you need on them. Okay? okay. So you know the first one is going to have a combination of ones, twos, threes, and fours, but you're not sure how many of each. 
And the other right. die can have whatever numbers you want. It doesn't have to be the traditional one through six. But you have to make a pair of dice so that when you roll them, only 12 will come up once. <laughs> and two will only come up once. Okay. <laughs> you got the idea? Uh -huh. Start thinking about it and start putting in some numbers. So we want to make sure we know the parameters here, right? Yes. Number two can only come up once. And what's the other number that can come up once? 12. 12. 12 can come up once. And the other rule, remember, one of the die can only be up to four. Gotcha. No number can be higher than four on the first die. The second number can have any numbers you want. <laughs> I like this. He's thinking that's exactly what we wanted to do is think. So start thinking out loud, Sam, and talk to Scott about what would you like to start with. Well, I think a one for maybe the dice that can go up to four. Okay. So we have up, up on the top, we have up, two, four, right? That's yes. this part right here. Okay. And over here we have any. Okay. Right? So there's our parameters there. Do we have any other parameters about the other numbers inside? Are there any, anything else we need to know about that, that problem? Well, if you have to get to 12 once, then you might want to take the highest one mm -hmm. so that when you go to the any, you can go, well, if you go up to four, you can put four for the 12 because it is the highest. It is the highest, no doubt about that. Or That probably should be the 12, right? Yeah. The interesting part is, well, I'm going to let you keep on talking. I really like the way you're thinking <laughs> about this. All right. And the two can be the one and the any can also be a one. So because we have so many choices over here for the any side, let's yeah. leave that for a minute. What okay. do you think the numbers can be in the up to four? Because then we can adjust the any numbers. We can make them smaller or bigger, right? Can the, I have one question. Can the any number be zero? You think you can put a zero on a die? No. Probably not so much. I guess you could have a blank side. Right. So, an interesting <laughs> question. Let's say you roll the two die and you have a one and a zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll come up with a one. Yes. yes. Is the one even a possibility that we want? So that's the question. Do we need no. to have these combinations? You have to have exactly the same number of combinations. All the other ones the same. So right. three is a two? Mm hmm Right. Oh, interesting. And so the four two, is a three? Yes. You have to uh. roll a two, but it, there can only be one way to possibly get it. What is the only way you can possibly get a two? One and one. So you know you're going to have a one and a one on each of those axes. Uh. Yes. Okay. So there's let's, your start. Let's at least fill in that part, right? A one and a one. Okay, what does that equal? Two. <laughs> you better put that one in. Okay, we we'll only have 35 more squares to go. <laughs> and so, we know that all the rest of them got to be the same too, right? So we have five was four, and six was five, and seven was six, and then it went down again from there, right? So eight was five, and nine was four, and ten was three, and then we got to squish that 11 in there, was two, right? That goes right in there. So yep. there's all the combinations again, yes. right from the other chart. But the number is going to be different. Mm -hmm. So we got the one part. So I'm going to give you one more minute to keep thinking about it. You're going to have okay. plenty of time. That's right. In order for us to get to the other stuff, I'm going to have you work on this for one more minute. Right, no doubt. So let's see what else can possibly. Do you want to go to the other extreme? The other what? The other extreme. We can, yeah, we can try the 12. So if we put a four over here, okay. then we would have to have an eight. We have to have an eight. That's the only way you're going to get a 12, huh? Yes. Do it. I like it. Here's the 12. We're down to 34 more squares to fill out. <laughs> Although, we can but fill out this one. What's that one? Well, that one would be 9. It would be 9. Go ahead and put a 9. And what about this one? A 5. Uh-huh. Good. So now you've got the corners, so corners filled in. And this is going to be a good strategy because yeah. you want to get those extremes out of the way. Right. All right. So because you are doing some excellent thinking right now, and I know you're going to finish this problem if you get yourself a meal, courtesy of our friends at Broken Yo Cafe. So congratulations on that. So right now, we're going to leave those screens the way they are. You're going to need to add a screen though, Scott. Okay. Because we're going to go back to the phones right now. And Azure, how are you today? Hello, Azure. Hi. What grade are you in? Second. All right. Well, I'm very glad that you called in today. What is the math problem that you're working on? Um, 30 plus 
13. And Azure, what do you want to do with this problem? Is there a specific way that makes it easier for you to work out? Um, I'm not really sure. Well, it'd be nice if we had a picture, right? Like if we had a whole bunch of chickens, like 30 chickens and 13 chickens, you could put them all together and you can count them up, right? That'd be kind of nice to be able yeah. to see what's going on. It would take me a really long time to draw chickens, though. So we want to have something a little easier to draw and easier to group as well. We want to be able to put things together in groups that you can understand. Okay, so how about just squares? You okay with squares? Yeah. Okay, so if I'm going to draw 30 squares, okay, it's going to take me a while to draw them individually. Can you think of a way that I can draw these 30 squares that are going to be a little easier to draw and easier to understand? How would you group 30 squares in groups of how many? Um, I would probably um, well, tell you what, how many fingers do you have? Ten. Ten. That's a great number. I like it. So let's make a couple groups of ten squares. Six, seven, eight, okay. nine. Right? I'm going to make three groups of ten squares because that's what we have here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, they're a little bit more like rectangles, but again, the uh, folks who are really good at art today are in the parking lot. <laughs> so there's our three groups of 10 squares, all right, or 10 small rectangles. What about the other side? We have 13 small individual squares, right? And I could take the time to draw all those squares. But if I was going to draw a nice big column of squares like I did on the other side, how many of those columns would I have in 13? Um. The number is right here before the three. What's that number before the three? Ten. Yeah, it is ten. That's right. I'm so glad you didn't say one. It's actually a ten because it's in the tens column. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have another column with ten boxes in it. And then one more small column over here with three boxes in it. That's your 13. So if we're adding them together, the nice part is exactly what you said. We can take this group of ten and add it to the other groups of 10. Azure, how many groups of 10 do we end up with? Um, we had three, and we're adding one more. Four. That's it. You got it. So we got four groups of 10, and we still have these other three hanging out over here. So we're just going to keep that on the end. That's one visual representation of a way to add these things together. I'm glad you called in today. Yeah, nicely done, Azure. Thanks for that phone call and for phoning in today. You've got yourself a pass to the Kern County Fair, so congratulations on that. Fair opens tomorrow. It'll be open, I think, it's about a week and a half. They think, I think they keep this thing open, yeah, right? Something like right. that. So anyway, plenty of time for you to go out. The weather's even uh, cooperating a little bit right there. Let's find out what's going on at NASA this week. A new long-duration right. space flight record. Our SpaceX Crew-6 mission is back home, and our asteroid sample return mission is on target. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. On September 11th, NASA astronaut Frank Rubio completed his 355th day on board the International Space Station, surpassing the record for the longest single space flight by a U.S. astronaut, which was previously held by NASA's Mark Vandehei. Frank, you've uh, made all kind of records. Agency leadership congratulated Rubio on the accomplishment during a call to the station. By the time Rubio returns home on September 27th, he will have spent about 371 days in space. The crew of our SpaceX Crew-6 mission is back home after spending about six months on the space station. On September 12th, a few crew members, including NASA astronauts Steve Bowen and Woody Hoberg, talked about the mission during a news conference at our Johnson Space Center. The highlights of the flight included Bowen's U.S. record-tying 10th career spacewalk. Our OSIRIS-REx spacecraft recently made a course adjustment to better position itself to release a capsule carrying sample material from asteroid Bennu toward the designated landing zone in the Utah desert. The capsule is scheduled to make a parachute-assisted landing on September 24th. OSIRIS-REx is the first U.S. mission to collect a sample from an asteroid. According to our Goddard Institute of Space Studies, the summer of 2023 was our planet's hottest summer since global records began in 1880. 
June through August was a combined 0.41 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than any other summer in NASA's record. This new record comes as exceptional heat has swept across much of the world, exacerbating deadly wildfires, resulting in searing heat waves, and likely contributing to severe weather. For more details, visit nasa.gov earth. That's what's up this week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, follow us on the web at nasa.gov slash twan. Always interesting stuff going on this week at NASA. Also interesting stuff going on in the parking garage here at KCSOS. Let's head back out to Sam and see what's going on with the Museum of Art. All right, thanks, Mike. All right, we're back here with the kids and Abby. Um, we're working on our Via Arte piece. So you can see they are hard at work down here, getting all their colors laid down. And uh, we're going to talk with Abby about how they're using a grid and how she took this picture and blew it up to this size. So let's go over here and check out her picture. So she has her picture here that they're doing. And then tell me a little bit about how you've broken up this grid and then blown it up for the kids so they can be able to use it. Yeah. So in chalk drawing and street painting, a lot of times you go from a very small image like this, which is just over nine inches on each side, and what they're working on is now five feet by five feet. And sometimes the professional squares can go over 15 feet in any direction. So starting with a reference, you can really end up getting your scale mixed up if you don't do your math and your prep work properly. So one of the methods that artists use is they use a grid. So as you will see, I've made a grid here and it matches the grid that we've drawn out that you can see the blue lines running through the image. So because this was a five foot by five foot square, we divided it into one foot by one foot squares. That made five across and five down. So we need to get this image now to have five squares down and five squares across. So the math that you have to do is to take the width and the height, which in this case is thankfully the same number since it's a square, but you need to divide that by five. Once you have that, you break it up into your, into your grid and you line it up. And now, instead of looking at a whole big image and trying to make it massive, you can just focus on one little square at a time. So the kids each got a section of, some of them are working with sections of a four by four, but it's still broken down. And that helps them be able to just focus on one area at a time without being overwhelmed by the big scale increase. So Abby, how did you um, tell them um, to, to begin to use the chalk? So for the chalk that they're using, it's not quite normal um, sidewalk chalk. It's, they're called soft she's pastels. So their pigment done. is a lot you know. richer, which is how we get such bright colors. And they first just scribble some color down and then they lightly rub it in with their hands to blend it out. And that gets more coverage of color and it helps them blend colors together. Like you see up where the green and the yellow are meeting. It's a nice, smooth transition. So once they finish um, just doing this top layer right here, um, what's the next part? We're just adding maybe the more details or the colors blending to make some more value, things like that? Yes, so right now we're just getting started with some color blocking and then we'll go in and we'll add some shades and values, um, especially with the color black and chalk, it a little bit goes a long way. So it's right. good to save that till the end or else you end up with a big muddy mess. Big old mess, yeah. So they're doing a great job laying down all of the bright colors and then we'll go through and add in some shading and any bright white spots at the end. Okay. And so each uh, student, they have their own little section that they'll be working on, right? Yes. And then I think they all got covered, right? Uh, yes, we might fill in the bottom few spots here at the end, but right. we're making really great progress. Looks wonderful. So have you done this before at the Via Arte? Yeah, you're doing a great job. Really doing great filling it all in, and I love seeing all the line and the bright colors. All right, so I think uh, we will see we'll stop here and then we'll see you back um and just a little while all right back to you mike
All right, thanks for that, Sam, and also thanks, Ab, for the uh, Bakersfield Museum of Art and all its supplies doing that via Arte on top of our parking garage right there. And it looks like they're having a lot of fun, and she was talking about a big muddy mess, and I'm sure the kids will be all cool with that, too. But it will look beautiful, I'm sure, when we check in with them one last time. Let's check in with Sam on her birthday, and uh, all right, so you've got it filled in. Explain to me what you did. Explain to me what you did. <laughs> well, I kind of... Well, I kind of winged it. You did wing it, but yeah. I know there was some thought going on. Because if yeah. you really were going to wing it, you'd have like 47 up there. Right? Yeah. And it wouldn't work at all. So there's definitely some thought that went into your winging it. Okay. Tell me about the top row, first of all. So We had the corners that initially when we left, right? Yes. So you knew there had to be a one here, had to be a four here. How did mm -hmm. you decide to have two twos and two threes instead of like three twos and one three? Well, I decided to have... At first, it was just that one, so uh -huh. I decided to have that one because it would make the three, right. and we needed two threes. Gotcha. And if I put a three there, then I could get a four and a five. Mm -hmm. And so you really, what you looked like to me you did is you added one number at a time, one yes. number to the top row, and one number to the side column mm -hmm. at a time. Not the whole entire top row first, but one number at a time yes. to try to make these totals, right? Uh-huh. Now, why did you skip a two on the left-hand column? I think it's because I had both of my threes already. Yes. And if I had another two, it would go with that one and make another one, but there's only two threes. Right. So this chart over here was good in helping you mm -hmm. monitor where your numbers were going, right? Yes. And then the last part, again, you look down at the left-hand side and you skip a seven. Yeah. What if you put a seven in there? Could you put a, have put a seven in there and moved them all up and not had a three? Would that I, have worked? No. Because if that three wasn't there, then that four would have gone and there would have been ah, too many sixes. It would have really thrown everything off, huh? Yeah. So, ready? I don't want to blow your mind too much, but think about this. If I said you have to have a seven in that left-hand side, you have to have it, and maybe you go down to, go down to four, right? Seven, six, five, four? Mm -hmm. Do you think you might be able to? I'm not saying you do it, but do you think you might be able to change the top to make it work? Probably. Probably. It's nice to be able to have some choices top and bottom, right? Or left yeah. and right. Maybe we can have three threes and a two or something fun like that. So there's different ways to do it, but the way that you went about it certainly met the criteria, right? And going one number at a time, you were able to cross things off as you go. And then, of course, the more you fill in on the row and the more you fill in on the column, the more of the chart you can fill in as well. Tell me about a pattern you see here. We saw a visual pattern on the previous one, right? Yeah. So if we look at the previous one real quick. We saw this pattern sevens and sixes and eights and everything went exactly diagonal. That's not the case in this new one. Tell me a pattern you see. So I see this pattern. It almost looks like stairs to me. Yeah. Can you draw it out for us real quick? Oh, yeah. Where if I go seven and then I go to that seven yep. and that seven and that seven. That so seven. there's still a pattern. It's nice that it ends and begins wherever you start, right, the same yes. way, right? There's two in a row, two in a row, one and one separately. What other yeah. patterns do you see here? Well, I see the eights, mm -hmm. the stairs, again. Oh, same thing, yeah. And the sixes, but now, oh, that didn't. Almost. You wanted it to be there, huh? I did. Got to have the five, though. Yep. <laughs> so there definitely is a pattern. It's just kind of all shifted. Yes. Right? But if you look at the nines. If you look at the nines. There's one over here. Whoa, that's a crazy pattern. Yeah, but... So, if you can not look at the top, don't look at the top, don't look at the top. Here's your pattern of nines, right? Uh-huh. If you were going to look at the top, what's the number you think should have a pattern the same way? Up at the top. The... Because here's your nines. The fours. And then, whoa, over there. Yeah, fours right above there, right? Or yeah. fives. Fours or fives? What do you think? Mm. Ah, here's your fives with the five over here. Okay. So, we had a couple other random ones that worked, but they didn't connect anymore. Yeah, but they, they, that side mirrors that side. That's right. So we still have some symmetry in this, and we love symmetry in mathematics. In fact, we love symmetry as human beings, right? We love to see butterflies with the same wings on both sides. In fact, we like to see people with the same thing on both sides of their faces, right? Two ears and two eyes and two nostrils and all that fun stuff. Well, you so, see now. Let's, let's, let's talk about making people unique. Also, it's great. Because, uh, There's nothing wrong with being unique, but it's just kind of how nature's created, and so I'm there really is the mathematics. Unique, Scott. In, in nature that we like to see. And it really is pleasing to our eye as people. We like to see that, you know, just like the art is, right? You can have abstract art that's also pleasing, but symmetry is something that kind of naturally is something that attracts us, I think. 
Right, just like when you see different things, you might see patterns somewhere and you'd be like, I kind of see a face in there. Right. It's just something that you naturally see all the time. Yep. So Sam, I've got a couple of questions for you. Did you have to think a little more on that problem than you normally do on some other problems? Oh, yes. Oh, good. That's exactly what I wanted. Do you have any idea what was happening as you were doing that thinking and struggling? <laughs> My brain was growing. What? My brain was growing. Your brain was growing, right? Because we did go over that in class because in order for your brain to grow and those synapses to fire and expand, you need to struggle. struggle. And that's exactly what you did. So you can be happy and rest assured that on your 12th birthday, you struggled and you know at least one thing happened on your birthday. Your brain grew because of the struggle <laughs> we made you go through right there. As a matter of fact, we're not going to let you struggle anymore right now. We're actually going to go check out some careers in the state parks. California, the most beautiful state in the Union with its stunning sun-kissed shorelines and celebrated mountain ranges has the nation's largest state park system with hundreds of miles of coastline, nearly a thousand miles of lake and river frontage, and 45,000 miles of trails. Protecting these resources, preserving the state's extraordinary biological diversity, and creating opportunities for high quality outdoor recreation is what it's all about at California State Parks. My name is Mireya Gutierrez. I'm a senior park aide at Prairie Creek Redwood State Park and I'm living the park life. My name is Emmett Harden. I'm a DOSA at uh, Colin Allensworth State Historical Park and I live the park life. My name is Robin Chase and I am a state park interpreter for Hearst San Simeon State Park and I live the park's life. We want you to join our team. State Parks invites potential candidates who are reflective of California's diverse population and love the outdoors to come live the park's life by working in one of our 280 state parks. We pride ourselves on protecting our resources, not only natural and cultural, but people too. We save lives. California State Parks peace officers and lifeguards ensure a safe, high quality outdoor experience for everyone. From off-highway motor vehicle enthusiasts and boaters, to campers and hikers, from caring for the state's historical landmarks and ongoing environmental sciences, to maintenance, conservation, and education. Come help us make a difference. We at California State Parks are passionate about preserving our precious state resources for all to enjoy. This is more than just a fulfilling, evolving career. It's a way of life. We live the park's life and so can you. There are a wide variety of employment opportunities across many disciplines including interpretation, education, recreation, law enforcement, cultural or natural resources, administration, operations, or facility management. We are proud of our commitment to develop the fullest potential in all our employees and provide leadership development to prepare our diverse staff for future challenges. We live the parks life. We live the parks life. California State Parks employees like what they do. Job satisfaction is high because we know we're on a rewarding path that makes a difference. Come make a difference with us. We live the parks life. My name is Rachel Marty Taylor. I'm an office technician and I live in the parks life. We invite you to live the park's life by joining our state parks team. Visit livetheparkslife.com to get your California state parks career started today. There you go. If you like the outdoors, nothing better than living the park's life right there. Hey, we have one more opportunity to go check out on the uh, upper part of the parking garage and check in with Sam and see how the Via Arte kids are doing. All right, thanks Mike. All right, we're back here with Abby and the kids and they're working hard on their um, uh, chalk <laughs> drawing down here on the ground. And so um, 
Abby, let us know like how far have they gone? What else do they need to finish here? Yeah, they're making great progress. Um, we've even got quite a bit of detail work going on in the fox that's in the center. His face is getting started and there's shading happening in the rest of his body. So they're doing a really great job using that black to add in shadows and getting all of those values in his face since it's a very detailed little face going on right there. And so when you're out at Via Arte, like this uh, concrete right here, it feels like it's a little bit rough maybe. So is the concrete at Via Arte a little bit smoother to work with? Yes, so at um, Via Arte, we use the parking lot at the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And so it's the typical black asphalt. Yep. And before we go out a few days before, a whole new layer gets put down. So oh, it covers cool. up the painted lines and it's just a nice slicker surface to work with. Yeah. Um, everyone still typically wears gloves to protect their hands, but it's a little bit softer and colors actually blend even better out there than they are here. Yeah. When I see like you have the students on some cardboard, so if uh, kids are getting them um, involved in this, like some things to maybe to get prepared for, I see you have knee pads. Oh yes, yeah. Anyone that's been out there a lot always knows cardboard and knee pads and pads to sit on are your best friend. Um, no matter your age, but especially if you've got older knees, All right. um, knee pads are your friend. And if um, anyone wants to get involved in Via Arte, um, how do they go about that? So if you're above the age of 18, you can apply to be an artist um, through the Bakersfield Museum of Art website. If you are under 18, we have what are called Bambino squares and they're for sale during the event and they are two foot by two foot squares and for $25 you get your own square and a box of chalk to go with it oh, to create whatever you want. That's great. So that is a great time and of course um, kids and kids at heart are welcome to do Bambino squares right. and they will also be high school groups out okay. working as well. Right and then is it all judged at the end? Um, so there are judges for the high school section okay. and the professional section. Mm -hmm. um, they are judged separately, but the Bambino area is just for fun. All right. Um, so with this, um, what is the, if people wanted to get involved, is there a website or? Um... Yeah, so it's all through the Bakersfield Museum of Art. Okay. Um, so you can go there and all of the upcoming um, Via Arte information is listed online. Um, we are also always looking for sponsors and that deadline hasn't hit yet, but I know okay. it's coming up in a few weeks here. Um, and so sponsors, um, they basically donate their money to the museum and that money goes towards a square for an artist to create their work on the professional side. That's wonderful. All right, well, I think that we're done here and if we are, the kids aren't quite finished yet here, but we're gonna be um, coming back here. If you wanna see the finished product, you can uh, go onto our social media page here at uh, the Do The Math social media page, maybe the Bakersfield Museum of Art Do The Math page, um, but we will show you the end product. So right. back to you, Mike. Thanks for that, Sam, and also thanks to all of the kids doing some hard work out there. And a uh, big thank you to Sam coming in on her birthday, doing some excellent work today. And you are now our newest ambassador. So you need a uniform. So let's see your uniform. We'll put it right up there to camera three. <laughs> there you go. Do you know what it means to be an ambassador? Like, almost in the, it's in the government. You can be in our government, the math oh. government, right? <laughs> or like country to country. All right. right. Well, you know what? You're simply going to let people know about do the math. Can you do that? So when you wear your shirt, you wear it around. People are like, hey, what's that? You tell them about the show and what you did. Sound good? Yeah. Deal? Deal. Especially on your birthday. Especially. There you go. Hey, until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and the Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.